By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have something special for you. It is going to be a clash of expansions. I'm playing with a complete Antiquities deck. And my opponent, Plague Doctor, is playing with a complete Arabian Nights deck. So these are two expansions that are gonna, going to battle against each other. I'm playing with Tron and White. All my cards are Antiquities except for the basic lands. And my opponent, he's playing with a complete Arabian Nights deck. It's blue, it's red, and it's green. And for him, it counts the same thing. All his cards are Arabian Nights except for the basic lands. So in a moment, I'm going to show you the two absolute stunning, beautiful decks but before we do, I would just like to point out that you can also go straight to the action and you can do that by checking the description below. There you will find a timestamp. Click on the timestamp that reads MTG Games and that will take you straight to the games. As for here, we are going to continue with the deck decks, starting with my deck, the Antiquities Brew. And this is it. This is the deck I built from the Antiquities expansion. And um, the start of this was actually quite easy because I knew I wanted to play Tron. I think Tron is something that Antiquities is famous for. So I knew I wanted to play Tron. That's going to take 12 land slots. I knew I wanted to play the Mistress Factories all four seasons. So that would take 16 slots. And then I kind of decided, okay, of course I'm going to play the Workshop. Of course I'm going to play the Strip Mine. So there just wasn't a lot of land slots left. So I was kind of forced to just play one color because remember... Um, you cannot play with Dual Lands or City of Brass because they're simply not part of the Antiquities expansion. Uh, what I decided with, with Plague Doctor was we would only choose cards from the expansion itself except for basic lands. So as you can see, I've put seven basic planes in this deck together. It makes a total of, um, let me see, 24 lands. Let's see, let's see, we've got 12, 16, 18, no, 25 lands in total. I think that's a nice number, 25 lands. Remember, you don't have Moxen, you don't have Soul Ring. So 25 may seem pretty steep, but actually it's not that much. And I think if I would have chosen to play with two colors, maybe that would have been the better choice. But that would mean I would really have to go with 28 lands at least, you know, because you don't have access to the basics, the City of Brass, the Moxen, the Black Lotus. So you really have to kind of look at, okay, what am I going to do? Now, I chose to add white to the mix. And the reason for that is that I'm just a big fan for Argivian Archaeologist. I've got a beautiful artist proof that you can see on this picture, but also my other two uh, archaeologists are in really, really good condition. I just love the card. I've got a play set in total, playing with three in this deck. Um, I really like it. And I also like another card in here, Argivian Blacksmith. Argivian Blacksmith, two white and one, and you can tap it to prevent two damage to any artifact creature. I always kind of find it cool to try to build with uh, prevention cards because damage prevention is kind of low on the level right it's it's deemed to be very uh, underwhelming not very powerful people will always choose lightning bolt over healing staff and um, they're right that's not wrong but i always want to kind of explore then okay what does the other sign of the coin have to offer because we do see that life gain is kind of gaining popularity in old school and of course ivory tower has already shown the insane power of life gain, but I think there's more to it than just the ivory tower. And the same goes for damage prevention. I think that damage prevention is not as, as strong as dealing damage, but I also think that it's interesting to kind of look into damage prevention more and see how can you utilize damage prevention? How can you use it the right way? And that's why I really wanted to play with the Argivian blacksmith. Um, now, as you can see, I'm not playing with a lot of white cards because the simple reason is I only have seven white uh, mana sources so I don't want to overdo it and that's coming to that point of talking about lands that's actually the biggest problem here with Argivian Archaeologist and the Argivian Blacksmith they're both a double white in their casting cost so I was really doubting between white and blue actually I think blue has Sage of Latinam one blue and one to cast for a one two creature that you can tap and sack an artifact to draw a card. I think that's very powerful in this specific deck and in an antiquities only deck because you're playing with tons of artifacts. So basically Sage of Latinam long term will give you card advantage. Your opponent will destroy one of your artifacts, probably lose a card in the process and you can in response tap your Sage, sacrifice your artifact and get a card in return. So they lose a card, you lose a card, but you get a card back. So that's card advantage, right? And also blue gives you access to Draftness Restoration, to Reconstruction. So for me, blue 
was a big deal as well. Another combination that I thought of, but I just didn't want to do because I thought it's just not fun, uh, is a talk with Shatterstorm because it's it's a pretty cool idea, I guess, to eat all your artifacts with a talk and then play Shatterstorm, destroying all the artifacts of your opponent. But then I thought, okay, I'm playing against an Arabian Nights deck, so probably I don't need any artifact removal. That was the first reason. So Shatterstorm was out. And then I thought, okay, Atok, it's probably the best option. You know, it's one red and one, so it's easy to play. You can sack your artifacts to pump it. It's very dangerous. It can be like an insta-kill when, when your opponent cannot block it and you've got enough artifacts on the table, which, you know, could really be the case looking at this specific deck, you know, playing Antiquities only. But... I just, you know, Antiquities, for me, I mean, Atok is just not as cool as the Argivian Archaeologist, you know, I just really wanted to play with the Argivian Archaeologist, that's just for me, you know, it's one of my pet cards, so I just decided, I just want to play with three of the Archaeologists, that's that, so that's basically why I chose for white, and of course the Archaeologist, once it's on the table, you've got it operational, it's an, a very, very strong card in this deck, it works together very well with the Tetravis, works together very well with Triskelion, and just in general, you know, having an engine to get cards back from your graveyard directly to your hand. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Talking about engines, it's really difficult in Antiquities only to kind of get a drawing engine going. So I'm playing with the Jalum Tome, uh, which draws a card, but then you've got to immediately discard a card. So it's actually not card advantage. You can just trade cards. You can kind of sift, sift through your hand in your deck, I guess. Um, but it does work pretty well with the Argivian Archaeologist, right? Because I can choose just to toss... Um, you know, to toss an artifact in the bin and maybe later get it back with my Argivian Archaeologist. Um, so that kind of works. I'm also uh, playing with the Mitre. So the Mitre is kind of this interesting card, like three to cast. And then when one of your artifacts gets, gets destroyed, I can pay three and then it can draw a card for that destroyed artifact. So what I was thinking about immediately when I saw the Mitre was this combination of Suchi and Mitre. So Mitre get, gets, uh, Suchi gets destroyed. I can use four of that mana, or three of those mana, I mean, to activate the Mitre and draw a card back. And then my Suchi goes to the graveyard, and maybe I can just get it back with the Archaeologist. So I was kind of thinking about that, and just the whole idea of getting value when a creature gets destroyed, I kind of really like that, you know? And it's really hard to draw cards uh, with this deck, so I thought, okay, let's just add the Mitre in this, and hopefully I can draw a little bit. I've also added Grapeshot Catapult. Maybe that's something that you've noticed. Um, it doesn't see a lot of play normally. It's four to cast for a two, three creature, and you can tap it to deal one uh, damage to a creature with flying. And I hope that I can get it on the board to kill some flying men. I'm expecting, you know, the, the Arabian Nights player to play kind of aggressively. So I thought, you know, maybe this can kill the flying men. Another thing that I thought of is maybe it can deal one damage to the Surrender Perfect, and then it can use the Triskelion points kind of kill a surrender Perfeet off with the Grape Shark Catapult uh, and the Trike. So that kind of sounds like a cool idea and a cool thing to do. So I really like like that idea. Uh, but I guess the main engine of this deck, because there's a little trick in this deck, uh, works with Candelabra of Taunus and Tron. So you can get tons and tons of mana. And then I want to use that mana to make a huge rocket launcher. So you can see I'm playing with three rocket launchers. One of those is an artist proof. That's why you see a little drawing. It's made by Pete Venters. Um, so what it basically what I want to do is uh, destroy my um, my rocket launcher and just pump a lot of mana into it with my um, uh, with my candelabra of Taunus and then basically get it back again uh, with the Argivian archaeologist and just do it again. So I'm really yeah looking forward to that. Another little trick I've got in here is the Argiv uh, is the um, rocket launcher and the obelisk of undoing. So obelisk of undoing is one to cast. It's pretty cool. You don't see this card often. Again, one of those forgotten cards I feel. Uh, and for six mana, you can return any one of your permanents in play to your hand. So this works really well with Triskelion, but also works really well with Tectrovis, and it works even better with rocket launcher. Remember, rocket launcher gets destroyed in your end step, right at the beginning of your end step. So what I can do is I can use it in my main phase. And then in that same phase, I can just send it back to my hand. And yeah, nothing happens at the end step because the rocket launcher is no longer in play. So that's kind of a, a cool little thing. A few cool little plants I've got in this deck. I'm also playing um, with Taunus's Coffin. Taunus's Coffin, you know, four to cast, three and tap, and you can take any creature and you can put it in the coffin. So it's exiled from play as long as the coffin remains tapped or stays in play. If the coffin gets destroyed, that creature returns to play 
uh, tapped, by the way. So not untapped. Another way to get the creature back is during my untap phase, I can choose to untap my coffin and then the creature comes back in play. Now, this is the cool thing. When it comes back in play, the uh, everything that would normally happen would happen again. So all the triggers work again. So if I've got a trike in the coffin with three, three counters on it, when it comes back into play, the three counters stay on it. And on top of that, I get another three counters. So I've got six counters on my trike. And I can do the same thing with my Clockwork Avian, and I can do the same thing with my Tetravis. So I've got a couple of tricks in this deck. Um, maybe one last card to kind of point out, although I think, <laughs> I think I've mentioned all the cards already, um, is the Urza's Chalice. So I think Urza's Chalice is just a really sweet card. One to cast, uh, you pay one and you can gain a life and you can pay one every time an artifact comes into play and you can just gain a life for that. So I thought, you know, I want to play with two of those because I think it could be relevant. You know, um, I'm expecting a lot of damage early in the game and then hopefully I can kind of stabilize and make sure that my opponent who I'm expecting to play aggressively, I kind of keep him on bay, uh, at bay. And I'm hoping that my chalices will give me some life gain to kind of get back and get out of the danger zone. So that's why I've played with two of these chalices. And just because they're, they're just cool, I just want to play with those. Um, so yeah, this is my deck. Let me know in the comments below what you think. And if you would make a deck with only Antiquities cards, what kind of deck would you make? Let me know in the comments below. And now we're going to look at the deck of my opponent, Plague Doctor and his Arabian Nights deck. And here we see the deck of my opponent, Plague Doctor. And as you can see, it's completely Arabian Nights except for the basic lands. And let me look at it. Isn't it just a beautiful picture? It, it has something special when everything comes together when you're just playing out of the expansion you can kind of see the expansion come to life all of this is arabian nights you can see that expansion coming to life that era of magic everything has the same border everything has the same coloring i really appreciate it that you've chosen to play with blackboard at lance that just makes it more like complete also the rook egg tokens the fact that they're red it kind of matches that style there on the right side i just really like this deck photo it's really cool and um before we kind of dive into what the deck wants to do um you've asked me to first thank a few people because you've borrowed a couple of cards to make this deck happen so let's start with that so special thank you to andrew capolati for the serendips the cities and the diamond valley and also a special thank you to kyle wells his brother in alpha for borrowing him the urnums and zooming in on the urnums by the way we see we see a beautiful altar a brossard altar there and uh, that's kind of stunning and really nice to have one of his altars being featured here on the channel as well hopefully we get to see that urnum in action and now let's kind of look at the deck and what the deck wants to do it is pretty straightforward right he wants to bash this is arabian aggro at its purest form only arabian cards and he wants to battle it out in 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 the in the fair way in the gentleman's way killing somebody through combat damage. I appreciate that. I appreciate that, uh, Plague Doctor, but I'm also a little bit afraid. I'm going to be honest, because look at this deck. Four Curd Apes, four Flying Men, two Caspian Ogre, two Brass Men. You've got 12 one drops in this deck. And then in your turn two, you can start playing Wailuli Wolf and pump those creatures to get me into trouble even further. And then you've got your Flying Bodies here, one of the best creatures in old school magic. Surrender a free three for a flyer for three mana. And that's just completely going to bash me if you get that on board pretty quick. And then you've also playing with four Urnums, the four or five creature for four mana. And you've got another four drop. That's a Rook Egg, a full play set of Rook Eggs. And, you know, I mean, I'm pretty afraid of this. You can deal a lot of damage. Luckily for me, because we're only playing in the expansions, you've got a similar problem as me when it comes to getting your colored mana, right? You have no access to Moxen. You have no access to Lotus. You have no access to Dual Lands. You do have four City of Brasses, so that's kind of nice. Um, it also kind of makes this deck a suicide Arabian aggro deck, by the way, because City of Brass is going to hurt you, Surrender Perfect is going to hurt you. You're also playing with four unstable mutations who, who are going to eat away your own creatures. But I kind of like that. This deck is really all or nothing, and then you've added a few really funny things in this deck, really cool things in this deck. Maybe the first thing to kind of zoom into is that unstable mutation. So unstable mutation really quite strong early game put it on a curd ape a flying man it's a lot of problem for me um but also when you put it on a rook egg i think that's even the cooler play to do because then you've got a three six body you can attack and you're giving your opponent a really difficult choice to make you're saying okay or you take the damage um you know or 
You don't take the damage, you destroy my Rook Egg, but in that case, I'm gonna get a 4-4 Flyer in return. So it's kind of a catch-22. There's, there's no really, there's no correct answer. Whatever choice your opponent makes, it's going to benefit you. So I think that's pretty cool. Another really nice thing, talking about, talking about the Rook Egg, is the card Metamorphosis. So Metamorphosis, um, yeah, such a funny, funny card. And a card hard, that hardly sees any play. It was mentioned in one of my mail days, actually. And uh, it's one green to cast for a sorcery. Really like the art by Christopher Rush. Um, and it reads, sacrifice a creature of yours in play for an amount of mana equal to its casting cost plus one. This mana can be of any one color, right? So you can pick the color, it doesn't have to be green. But here is kind of the catch for me at least. It can only be used to summon creatures. I wish, I really wish that you would just use the mana for whatever you wanted to. It wouldn't mean that the card would be overpowered. Come on, you know? I mean, just to, to use the mana to pump, I don't know, let's be boring, pump it in a fireball. It wouldn't make the card broken in any in any regard, you know? Uh, but okay, it is what it is. You can only use it to cast creatures. In this case, that's actually pretty useful because there are almost only creatures in this deck. So I guess an ideal situation for the Metamorphosis would be if you cast the Metamorphosis on the Rook Egg, then you sacrifice the Rook Egg, right? You get back five mana and you use that mana to cast even more creatures, like for example, an Urnum Jinn and a Flying Man. Um, although they all have to be of the same color, right? So I guess you could do uh, a Surrender Perfreet and a Flying Man, for example. Uh, but anyway, so the ideal situation is to use the Metamorphosis to sack your Rook Egg and to play your creature out. So then you have a 4-4 flying creature and probably another big beefy creature on the board as well, just um, in, in, in one turn with one card. So I guess that's kind of the, the ideal situation of how to use Metamorphosis in this deck. So I think it's really cool that you've put it in because I, I think you messaged me and you told me that you were going to show me how you can use Metamorphosis uh, in, in, in a good way. So I'm looking forward to that and hopefully uh, you can play Metamorphosis in this match. Now another card that's a, a one-off in this deck that I want to point out just because I think it's such a cool card and it's it, it, these are the cards that people made in old school. These are cards that I don't think are going to be made anymore and that is Singing Tree. One green and three to cast. It's an 03. It's on the reserve list, I think. Um, and it's just so funny. When you look at the art, you just see a little mouth on the tree and a little nose and it's, he's, he's actually just, he drew a singing tree, the artist, Rob Alexander. He drew a singing tree in this very tranquil forest. I like the art, by the way. I'm just laughing at the the simplicity of, you know, I want you to draw a singing tree. And you're like, you're, you're an artist, you're getting this from wizards. Can you draw a singing tree? And you're like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll draw a singing tree. And this is it, you get a singing tree. <laughs> it's... What it does, by the way, it's, it's pretty useful. You can tap it to reduce an attacking creature's power to zero. And, you know, in a format where you also have Maze of If and you have very good removal, like Swords to Plow series, you know, Lightning Bolt, the, this card doesn't see a lot of play. But I do think it's worth mentioning that, you know, what Maze does is it untaps a creature and takes it out of combat completely. And this does something which is in a way more interesting. It reduces the power of target creature to zero. So that means that all of a sudden a 4-4 four four becomes a 0-4 and now you can block it with one of your 4-4s four without having to trade it. So in a way the Singing Tree is then better in a Maze of If, you know, in those specific scenarios. And another nice thing that you can do is combine it with the Swords because the Swords, when you Swords a creature, your opponent gains life equal to the power of that creature. But when you use the Singing Tree, it reduces the power to zero. One of the things that's a little bit unfortunate for me is that it's only on attacking creatures. But then again, I do like the flavor of that. Like I can see this this, this creature, let's say, um, let's say an air elemental comes in, you know, fierce wind and it goes through the forest, you're fighting against a green mage. And then that air elemental starts hearing this beautiful singing and the air elemental becomes all serene and relaxed and the hatred goes away and it turns into an O4 who's just a little bit you know, dancing through the forest. The wind is now a breeze. It's no longer a storm. You know what I mean? Like I can kind of see that happening. So from a flavor perspective, I like it. But from let's try to make this card a little bit more playable, I don't like it. You know, if you know what I mean. Um, okay, well, this is, this is enough, uh, enough mambling, rambling uh, from my part. This is the deck of Plague Doctor. Plague Doctor, thank you so much for bringing this to the table. Now let's go and see uh, what which deck is better, which deck works better, at least in this matchup. Let's go to the games. 
Game number one, and let's see who's going to win this expansion battle. Is it going to be Arabian Nights or the Antiquities? Let me know in the comments below. I'm playing with Antiquities, by the way. My opponent, Plague Doctor, is playing with the Arabian Nights deck, and it looks like he's taking a mulligan here. And uh, we've decided to do Gentleman's uh, Mulligans, which means if you have no lands or only lands, you can take a free mulligan. Um, and I think in this case, he had a one lander or something. So this is just a regular Mulligan. We are playing with Mana Burn, by the way. So we're playing his Modern Rules with uh, Mana Burn. So let's take a look. Plague Doctor taking a new hand. Is he going to keep this one? I think so. I mean, you really have to have a bad hand to take another mole, right? He's playing with 12 one drops. Yeah, here we go. So he's keeping it, putting one on the bottom. So I'm expecting him to have a turn one play. First, I'm, uh, I get to start here with a Mishra's Factory passing turn. Plague Doctor here, Mountain into Curdape. Okay, there's your one drop. That Mishra's Factory is going to be really, really good for me because it's going to slow my opponent down. Oh, look at this. I'm getting aggressive going in there, pumping it with my other Mishra's Factory. So two Mishra's Factories on the board. This is going to be a problem for Plague Doctor. Playing an island. Can he find a Flying Man attacking me for one? And no creature, nothing played. Just passing turn. Ooh, good news for me, but bad news for Plague Doctor. Attacking again, pumping it to three. And it looks like all of a sudden I'm the beatdown here. I'm the aggressive player. I didn't see this coming. I thought Plague Doctor with 12 one drops and unstable mutation would be far more aggressive. But look at that. He's just passing turn. He must have, have a lot of green cards in hand. He's playing with three colors. Oh, a Mishra's Workshop. This is bad news for Plague Doctor. Looks like this first game is going to be over soon. Tetra was hitting the table a 4 4 flyer. And remember, we're only playing with the expansions, no land drop. Wow, okay, and here we've got some nice tokens sent to me by the Venetian Lions. Shout out to you guys, and I'm still using your beautiful tokens. There are the three Tetravites, 1-1 one, one Flyers. They do have Summoning Sickness, so I can only attack with my 1-1 one, one Flyer, and of course I can pump my factories. Ooh, what am I going to do? Clockwork Avian! So Clockwork Avian is an 0-4 Flyer that comes into play with 4 plus 1 plus 0 counters on it. So basically it's a 4-4. Every time you attack, though, after damage is dealt, you take a counter away and also when it blocks. So when it attacks or blocks, you lose a counter. There's another Curdape. Oh, I feel sorry here for Plague Doctor. Luckily, it's just our first game, but he's very unfortunate. This is not really a game. This is just somebody getting mana host and there's not much you can do. Look at that. I'm just attacking full force. I'm just going to you know, end it as as quickly as I can. There's a double block of Curdape on a Mishra's Factory, so I'm going to lose a Factory here, but he's going to take 2, 6, 10 damage. He's going to go to 12, taking away a counter. Wow, there's a clay statue. There's so much on the board on my side. There's another Curdape. <laughs> Sorry, man. So Plague Doctor really only drawing Curdapes here, and that's about it, and yeah. That's game number one. Not really a game. Um, it, it's you know it's cool for me, of course, to see my deck working so well. But hopefully in game number two, Plague Doctor can uh, can just draw into his land. So let's quickly go to game two. Game number two. Here we go. So I'm ahead. Does mean that Plague Doctor gets to start. So does he have a four? At least he finds a four this time around, but not a one drop. Not a Gasban Ogre, for example. That's one of his green creatures, 2-2 for one green. And I'm playing a Candelabra of Taunus. There is a Mountain. Again, not a creature. I really expected Plague Doctor to be able to play way more aggressive. He seems to be a little bit unfortunate, although he does find the lands he needs. Maybe with another blue land, will there be a Surrender per Freak? That would be a huge problem for me. A 3-4 early Flyer. And I've played that Mishra's Factory, by the way, that Winter Edition. And uh, it looks like he's just going to pass turn here. Or not. Okay, wait a minute. Tapping one green. There's a Gasban Ogre. Oh, man, loving this card. This is so nice. So it's a 2-2. Two -two. And remember, during the upkeep, it goes to whoever has most life. So if I find a way to get more life, playing a Plains... And what I can do now, I can animate my Mishra's Factory, make it into a 2-2, and then when he blocks, I can use my Candelabra to untap it and actually pump itself. So I'm now going to untap it, pump itself, a 3-3, killing the Gasban Ogre. And this is some broken stuff. You know, I can already hear the comments going crazy about this. Uh, we are playing with modern rules, and I agree, this is kind of funky. 
I do love the way though that candelabra of Thomas can be used with this. Um, there is an Urnum Jin 4 5 powerhouse. Okay, now this is a problem for me. 4 5 playing another mine. Oh man, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm very far away from Tron with those two mines. I wish that would have been a tower or at least a power plant. Playing a Jalum Tome, so that's a little book. I can pay two and draw a card and then I have to directly discard a card as well. So it's kind of a way to go through my deck finding answers. It looks like I'm just uh, going to take some damage here. Oh, an unstable mutation. Oh, this is a seven, eight. Oh man, he's almost gonna half my life total here. He's gonna get me to 13, right? Or does he have another unstable? Okay, luckily he does not have another unstable, but I'm gonna drop to 13 here. This is just ridiculous. There's a brass man. Oh man, okay, a power plant, that's something. Maybe I can use the book to try to find a tower, although I'm, I've already played a land, of course, that's a power plant, so I wonder, I just need, I first need a blocker, right? I need something to stop. Okay, there's a clay statue, I can regenerate it, but I don't have enough mana. It's a 3-1 and you can pay two to regenerate it. Does that mean that I'm gonna take even more damage now? I wonder what Plague Doctor, what I'm gonna do actually. I, I know that Plague Doctor is just gonna swing in probably. So I guess my clay statue gets forced walk from the Urnum here and that counter is to indicate the first minus one, minus one counter on the Urnum. So the Urnum is now a 6-7. Let's see what Plague Dark can do. Attacking with the 6-7 here. Interestingly enough, he's not attacking with the Brass Man. Maybe I would have attacked with the Brass Man as well. I'm on 7, playing a Rook Egg. Oh man, things are looking bad for me. But starting next turn, I can start blocking with the clay statue at least if i can find oh there's a tower i've got tron and remember i've got candelabra of tron is on the board as well so i can now tap it looks like i'm counting i can now tap for nine mana so you see the dice indicating that now i'm using the candelabra to untap my four land so i've got five mana floating i'm using four of those to cast a rocket launcher oh this is sweet rocket launcher in combination and i'm playing a tetravis as well Okay, so things are really, really looking much, much better for me. I think drawing into, I believe that was a top deck. Top decking that Urza's Tower makes all the difference. Now, I want to make sure not to use too much mana. There is Urza's Miter. That is a pretty cool card. So that's a card when I lose a creature or lose just any artifact. When it goes to the graveyard, I can pay three and draw a card. And that uh, button there is to indicate the forced walk. So my Tetravis gained forced walk. He's probably going to swing in with the Urnum, but now I can block the Urnum with the clay statue and regenerate. Ooh, this is actually a problem attacking with the egg, although the egg is now a 3-6, so I can just block it with the Tetravis, right? Not sure why I'm putting my... Um... Ooh, this is interesting. Okay, so I'm animating my Mistress Factory. We've got one mana floating. Then after I declared blocks, I'm going to use the other mana. I'm going to tap the Mistress Factory and use the floating one to regenerate the clay statue. And am I doing that to kill the Urnum or something? Let's see what happens. So he's playing a Surrendip. It's not really clear to me why I did that, because then I could deal five damage did I want to kill something? Okay, this is just weird. I'm not sure why I did that block. Um, yeah, probably just a misplay. And then I'm doing my Candelabra of Taunus trick again. And I've got something floating, playing a Triskelion here. So that's, I mean, things are looking up for me. Ever since I drew into that Urza's Tower, you know, in combination with that, uh, with that Candelabra, I was able, I'm able to do some, uh, some silly stuff. Drawing a card now, discarding it immediately as well. That is the Strip Mine, by the way, and playing a Yoshin Soldier, so 1-4. And when you attack with it, you don't have to tap it. That was a weird, that was a weird little block that I just did. I'm still puzzled what I wanted to do there, but anyway. So water under the bridge, the Mishra's factory is gone. That's the conclusion of that whole uh, shenanigans. And now he's attacking again. And you can see those dice indicating the minus one, minus one counters on Plague Doctor. Unfortunately, he didn't have any dice at hand while we were playing the game. Um, I believe I can just 
block the rook egg on the Yoshin soldier, the 4 4 flyer on the Surrender Pafrit. So I guess the Surrender is going to die here, or maybe he has a trick up his sleeve, and I can use the clay statue to block the Urnum. I do take one damage from Mana Burn here, that's why I'm, uh, my life is going down. Again, this is a mistake because I could have used a white mana and then do a double regeneration shield on my clay statue. And I guess Plague Doctor also made a mistake with the Surrender. So uh, yeah, playing a little sloppy here. The conclusion is that the Surrender Pafrit dies and I took a damage from Mana Burn. And uh, both things weren't necessary. There's another Urnum played by Plague Doctor. But I mean, things the, the, the table has really changed after that uh, Urza's Tower because... Um, you know, Plague Doctor was really ahead of the game, but now I'm feels like I'm kind of ahead of the game. I've got more creatures. I can block. I can do silly stuff. You know, Plague Doctor has a couple of dying creatures with that Urnum. And, of course, a Rook Egg, but he wants a Rook Egg to slowly die away anyway. But I think that next turn he can't really swing in or do anything. Playing another creature, there's a Suchi. And the more creatures I play, the harder it's going to be here for Plague Doctor. He needs to find a way to get through. Maybe if he draws into his Desert Twister, you know, then he at least can get rid of one of the threats on the table. So 4 minus 1 minus 1 counter is now on that Urnum, so that Urnum is now a 3-4. This one is the 4-5 that he's attacking with. And I wonder what I'm going to do. Maybe block with the Clay Statue and kill it with the Trike? Taking two counters off, that would be an option because I can just regenerate the clay statue. I still have that um, rocket launcher as well, by the way. Yeah, it looks like Plague Doctor's changing his mind. He's looking at my board says like, I can't really do anything. And he's playing two little one ones. Probably wants me to use the counters from Triskelion. It's probably worth it for me because you don't want the Wailuli Wolf. You don't want to give it time. So because now it's still a summoning sickness. But once it doesn't, you can just tap it to give anything plus one plus one, which is hugely annoying when you're playing with a trike. And, um, you know, I've been on the side of the table with the Wailuli Wolf active and facing a trike. And it was actually kind of funny because my opponent didn't want to spend two counters on a Wailuli Wolf. But yeah, that made it really difficult for him to use his, uh, his trike effectively. Drawing into something here, looking at my at my mana. I don't want to take any mana burn because I'm already quite low. I'm on six. I'm a little bit in the tank here, trying to count. Okay, if I tap everything, then again, you know, I can just put it in the regeneration shield. So, yeah, maybe I kind of missed that because you can just make as many regeneration shields as you want. So as long as the mana that I make are an even number, I can just pump everything into the clay statue regeneration shield. First attacking here, four more points of damage for Plague Doctor. And it really looks like he's just going to die from my flyer. And there are more counters. So now the Rook Egg has got three minus three minus three counters. So it's just an 0-3 again. And that's a lot of threes, by the way. <laughs> and um, Plague Doctor has got five minus one minus ones. So yeah, that is now a 2-3 or even smaller. Yeah, I believe it's a 2-3 now. And there's just not much that Plague Doctor can do here. All he can do is really sit back and slowly die. It looks like his hand's empty too. Is there even an extra minus one, minus one on there? Okay, then it's a 1-2. I'm not sure. Yeah, drawing a card here. Playing a City of Brass. There's just nothing he can do, really. He's kind of stuck here. And he's just attacking with everything. He's saying, you know, I, I don't just want to die quietly. I'm just going to do an alpha strike. Why not? And I, I like that, Plague Doctor. I like your style. I mean, it's cooler to just attack. You know, math is for losers. And I just go in there. Or math is for blockers, actually. Sorry, it's not... <laughs> oh, man. Sorry. Sorry to all the mathematicians on the channel. Uh, I didn't mean it like that. But maps for blockers, you know, that's something you say in magic. Anyway, uh, there's some stuff happening here. It looks like I've blocked with the Suchi, used the other counter to kill the Urnum, used the four mana to activate the Mitre to draw a card. And, uh, yeah, it's always kind of hard to follow. We're using a clay statue to block with the Brass Man. 
and using the Triskelion block the 1-1 one -one on his on one of his other creatures, not sure which one. Anyway, activating the Miter again. So I actually got two cards from the Miter, which is pretty sweet. I've never used the Miter before. So thank you, Plague Doctor, for giving me the opportunity to use the Miter. And then I'm killing him with a huge rocket launcher, rocket <laughs> shooting it at the Plague Doctor. Wow. I mean, this second game was definitely more interesting. Like we could see the deck working, uh, but then I top decked that Urza's Tower and it kind of went downhill from that point forward. So again, kind of bad luck for Plague Doctor here. If I wouldn't have top decked that Urza's Tower, I kind of feel like he would have won this game because I was already so low in life. His deck was doing what he wanted to do. Now, the good news is we played a third game because um, I really just wanted to see the Arabian aggro deck being fully aggro. So we're going to go to game three. So stick around and let's see if the aggro deck can really be aggro in our last and final game. Let's take a look. Game number three, so the last game here, and the big question is, can Plague Doctor save the honor of Arabian Nights? He needs to bash my skull for this third game, pardon my French. And I think it's possible. I mean, first game didn't draw into the right lands, didn't draw into any lands, actually, after I think his third land. Um, couldn't find a green source. Second game, he was winning, and then I top decked the Earth's Tower, and the game completely shifted. And now we're in the third game, and let's see if he can get his aggro deck working here. There is a good start, at least. Flying Man on the table, turn one, one, one flyer. And uh, I'm just playing a tower passing turn here, so that means he's got some damage in the bag already. And playing another City of Brass, attacking me here, dropping to 19. He's also a 19 because of the brass damage. Ooh, no turn to play though. That's a bit unfortunate, unfortunate. And I'm finding a power plant. Can I assemble Tron again? That is the big question. And ooh, Surrender per free three, four flyer. It's taking two damage though. Look at his life total. He's on 17. He's actually lower than me and I haven't done anything. Well, I've played out lands, that's it. Finding a planes here, not finding my, uh, my mine, which is very unfortunate. And this happens a lot with Tron. I don't know if you're watching this and if you're a Tron player in old school. The difficult thing with Tron is, um, in old school, it's really hard to find and assemble the lands. So if you don't have the lands, you need to find a strategy not to die. And when you do have the lands, you need to find a strategy that you can take advantage of that. And it's really worth while assembling Tron. So you got to find that balance. Uh, Plague Doctor is hitting me with some more damage, by the way. Dropping to 14 here. And he's playing a Rook Egg. At least it's not an Urnum. That's something, but look at me, I'm on 14. Actually, Plague is also on 14, which is funny because I haven't done anything. Well, oh, whoopsie doo, now I'm playing a Candelabra of Tannis, which can be awesome with Tron. We saw that in game two, but right now it's useless. I'm missing my land drop, by the way. Uh-oh, I'm in big, big trouble. Attacking here, going to 10. I mean, next turn, I need to do something or else I'm toast. There's a Wailuli Wolf. Even more creatures on the board, at least finding a land here. Unfortunately for me, it's another tower, but I'm having four mana. Four is an important number in my deck. Playing Tannis' Coffin, it's a pretty good card, but it's too slow for now, right? I gotta pay three and tap the Coffin to take care of one creature, and that's probably gonna set me back another turn, and I'm already on 10. My life total is halved. I wonder what Plague Doctor is gonna do. Using his Wallowly Wolf to pump his, uh, the Flying Man to a 2 2 flyer. Why is he doing that now and not during combat? On the other hand, I'm tapped out completely, so he can just do whatever you know he wants because I'm not able to intervene. I'm on 10, he's gonna at least deal five. Oh, unstable mutation! Oh man, he's gonna hit me for eight. Of course, taking a damage from the city of Brest. Funny to see, by the way, that he's on 11 without me dealing a single point of damage. That's all, that's all self-inflicted pain. But I'm on two now. I mean, this is done, right? What can I do here? At least, at least draw into Tron, do something funny. I guess I'm not drawing into Tron here. And um, so this seems to be a very one-sided game number three. It kind of reminds me of game number one uh, when the roles were, were turned around. Um, and he's actually putting me on one. I think because it's our last game, he told me that he wants to try to draw into Metamorphosis and show me how he wants to use the Metamorphosis. Um, so he's kind of keep keeping me alive. 
And uh, I'm trying to take advantage of that using Thomas's coffin, putting the Surrender Perfreed in the coffin here. And you can see Plague Doctor turning that upside down, finding another Mistress Power Plant. So I'm kind of unfortunate here with my mana. And uh, yeah, what can I do? Paying for, there's a Suchi. At least needed a Clockwork Avian to, uh, to at least being able to block the Flyer. Playing my 4-4 Suchi. And uh, that Flying Man, by the way, I mean, it is going down in uh, in power and toughness each turn. A minus one, minus one counter is placed on there. But Plague Doctor didn't have any counters at hand at the moment. Okay, so I see I'm using that dice to indicate that there's one, minus one, minus one counter on that Flying Man. I believe there should be two, actually. But, I mean, this game is pretty much played anyway. He's waiting for his Metamorphosis. Maybe he can find it, and, and we can see it here on the channel. I'm playing a Rocket Launcher. And uh, let's see what else he can do. Playing another Rook Egg and passing turn. So that Flying Man is now a 2-2. And playing another Suchi. I mean, putting some more pressure on the board. It doesn't really change anything. Playing a Curd Ape here. I think, I think Plague Doctor, you should just, yeah, just, just kill me. Kill me now. I mean, yeah, that's it. That's it. I think Metamorphosis just wasn't meant to be for this matchup. Maybe we can play some more games. And uh, yeah, now we're looking for that metamorphosis, but um, it's uh, it's hidden, man. It's hidden in your deck. Are you actually playing with it, or was it just on a deck photo, showing the Diamond Valley, which is quite useful? Anyway, this is the game Singing Tree, which is pretty cool. Uh, I wanted to thank you for watching uh, this expansion battle. Yeah, there's the metamorphosis. So yeah, here he kind of showed me what he wanted to do with the metamorphosis, and I also mentioned that uh, in the deck deck after he showed it to me. So he wants to use his metamorphosis to get an Urnum Jin out and then also to get that 4-4 Flyer. So I must say, Plague Doctor, I appreciate that, man. That is pretty cool. And I also want to thank you for this game. And I also want to thank you, the viewer, for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks. Let me know what you think of these expansion battles. You know, maybe we can do uh, another one and this time with Legends. I don't know if there's anybody who has a big enough Legend collection. I'm sure they're out there and they can build a Legend deck. That would be kind of cool. Um, yeah, let me know what you think of expansion battles in the comments below. Let me know what you think of this video. And if you want to help out the channel, um, you can do that very, very simple by leaving a like, become a subscriber if you're not a subscriber yet. And of course, by sharing uh, the content that I make on your socials if you want to. So if you do, thumbs up for you. I really, really appreciate it. Another way you can help is you can support the channel financially. Uh, and help me keep doing what I'm doing. And you can do that by becoming a member of the Timmy Talks Patreon page. There's probably a link popping up right now. Click on the link that will take you to the Timmy Talks Patreon page and you can sign up. It already starts with $1 and then you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord and we can play a game on the channel. And what we can also do is we can get your name on the end scroll. How cool is that? Talking about the end scroll, let's take a look at the fantastic and amazing channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Let's go to the end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? 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 Ik het als ik het als zomba kan zien.